This is Guardian Radio, your station for up-to-the-minute news, intelligent, interactive, and engaging conversation. 96.9 FM. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Networks. You're now in the Essential Zone, where we seek to be informative, inspirational, enlightening, and dynamic. But more importantly, we seek to be fair and balanced. There comes a time when the game tolerates no spectators, only players. There comes a time when we must recognize that our individual aspirations shape our collective destiny. There comes a time when getting in the game, despite the risks, despite the challenges, regardless of the cause, is simply the right thing to do. There comes a time when we must find our hearts, find our soul, and pursue our purpose for the greater good of all, for country, for humanity. There comes a time when we must manifest our true greatness. Yes? There comes a time, and that time is now. So let's get down to the essentials. The essentials. Serious radio for serious people committed to advancing the national conversation. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the essentials. Welcome to Guardian Radio. 96.9 FM. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with you. We are going to have ourselves a conversation and we're going to be talking um, primarily about the budget presentation. I know that you have heard uh, many, many aspects of this and you have also read um, significantly, would have read in the newspapers and so on. Um, commentary is all over. But we, you know, we want to take our own um, way, make our own kind of walk through and to see exactly what it is that we can glean and to bring our own perspectives to the whole process. And we can start the conversation early this evening, 323-6232, 325-4316, and 325-4259. So you don't have to wait until, you know, we get deep into the show. We want to hear from you early. So you listen to the budget. What is it that you liked? What didn't you like? What are some of the things that you anticipated that didn't turn up? What are some of the things that you didn't anticipate that did turn up? What uh, about this particular budget is different compared to the previous one or previous ones? Is Are you of the view, as noted by the, the headline here, we are going in the right direction? So the current administration is saying that they're moving in the right direction and that's from the tribune the guardian says 690 million more in debt and debt to hit 11.6 billion dollars so you know again everyone will uh, kind of showcase a different perspective what we want to do is to have a very fair and balanced discussion a discussion which takes into consideration your views i will outline some of my points and we will see where we can go from there so what exactly are you excited about on this budget presentation we have not got, gotten into the details which will come in the sectoral debates and the, for, as the various ministers present their segment but what exactly are you excited about or why might you not be excited about what are some of the things that you wish was there what are some of the things that you love the fact that they've they, 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 they've been stated one one area which i i think that this particular budget did very well on, um, not in absolute terms, because you can always argue for more. You can argue, argue that some additional things were supposed to be done. But when you, when you go to the, 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 the prime minister's presentation and you look at the budget in totality, I mean, every single aspect of it, not just the ones which are directly pointed to, say, social services or urban renewal. When you take into consideration the totality of the budget, including the opportunities for, 
for home ownership, the the rebate on value-added tax, um, potential for investment in family island rentals, the reduction on food, some food items, which I think will create some level or some measure of balance as it relates to the impact of VAT, that the impact of VAT would have had because the zero, I, zero rated and exempt items were removed. When you take the totality of that into consideration, I think this, one of the strongest element of the budget was what I am going to term its social focus. That means the focus on the individual, the citizenship, the, 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 the well-being, seeking to, I would say, improve purchasing power, and, but also seeking to create opportunities for you know, wealth creation, for persons to become more involved in ownership, especially at a, at a, at a, at a household or at the housing um, level, and through housing, well, with the rental properties in the family islands and so on, you know, to, to, to get into some investment, to get into developing your or flexing your own muscle from an entrepreneurial perspective, creating generational wealth. So I thought that that was kind of the strongest point in the budget. Uh, you know, and it, in many ways, I think that view contrasts sharply with some sentiments expressed elsewhere. And in some regard, I find the, those expressions just a little bit surprising that they would actually come in that manner because the totality of the budget, you know, that was not the point to, 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 to focus on. Now, there are some other areas which, we, which I think should get some attention in terms of um, critique, if you will, and discussion. And we're going to talk about them, but let's get into uh, a, a little bit of the narrative. So this is the first budget that the new administration led by uh, Prime Minister Davis is presenting. So all that they have done up to this point was represent or report on the budget which was created and delivered by the previous administration under the then Prime Minister Hubert Minnis. And so it, in, in, the, in, in, in the presentation of this, um, the way forward, he actually said that, that as a new administration for the first time, being able to fully lay out its priorities and choices in a national budget, we wish to present a landmark budget and you know that's a that's a really interesting term. We wish to present a landmark budget, one that steers the country in a new direction, better able to take advantage of the opportunities which we have been blessed with, which we have been blessed, and also to withstand and overcome the many challenges currently facing the world in which we live. An important statement. So first of all, the anticipation is that this budget, uh, per, per the Prime Minister, is going to be landmark. I mentioned someplace, somewhere, uh, that this particular budget, before the presentation was done, that this particular budget could represent maybe one of the most important in history of the country. And certainly, at least in recent history, the way I coined it was, it may very well be one of the most important. I've heard one or two persons um, comment on that, um, you know, essentially dismiss the view that a budget is a budget, it's a one-year thing. I don't believe that. I don't hold to that. Because there's a, there, 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 there are many reasons and, you know, of course, there's space for me. I could be wrong. But there are many reasons for me drawing that conclusion as to whether this was an important budget, significantly different from everything that we have seen up to this point in time. If you, if you follow me and you follow my writings, you would have seen that one of the things that I've said in recent times is that 
the the Bahamas, recognizing that the Bahamas has always been very resilient. This is something which Bahamians say instinctively. We're very resilient. And as an economy, as an economy, this is also referred to in that particular way. The economy is referred to in that particular way. I make the argument, though, that this time around, this time, compared to the, the 90s, compared to 2008, 2009, compared to all of the other shocks which we have, we, we, we have faced, this time around is different. And it is different because the country as a whole is at a place where it is at its weakest economically, it's the weakest it has ever been in terms of the underlying fundamentals, in terms of some of the challenges it's faced with debt. Never before, never before has the Bahamas experienced debt to GDP at this level. Absolutely not. Never before has there been such a narrow gap space between the stock of external debt and internal debt. I think at this point in time, it's like 53 to 47, 47 being external. It has never happened. I remember when, when, I, when, I, when I just came to this country to live, and in discussion, I always remember having some discussion with um, Tony Kiki Varakis, who was a partner at Deloitte & Touche when I was there. And one of the things he always draw attention to and always pull us back to in those conversations Remember, remember that despite the level of debt, whatever the level of debt was at that point in time, the bulk of it was domestic. And that meant something. It, that was fundamental in the overall economic strength of the country. And it's a big contributor at this point in time. But the scales have been tipped. And we're trending in the direction of more external debt versus domestic debt. Also, the servicing of those debt carries greater burden than the domestic debt, I think, uh, based on the analysis in the current budget. $275 million for domestic payments versus $313 million for external. So the scales are tipping. So from an overall loan perspective, we've never been this weakened. Never in the history of the Bahamas, never, I can say this very confidently just based on research, never in the history of the Bahamas has the country ever had external debt which are trading at the yields that the current debt is trading. And that is a function of, obviously, the, the effects of the pandemic, but also a function of that shift in the stock of debt and certainly the ability, or at least from the lender's perspective, the ability for the country to repay. And that ability is not looked at in absolute terms, but looked at within the narrow confines of what policies are in place to extract taxes and fees from the overall economic arrangement of the country. Basically, I'm saying it's like you, you have a debt, a mortgage. The lender doesn't look at your potential to earn, even though that may be a consideration. But in real terms, the lender looks at how much you are earning. If you go to them and say, you know, in another five years, I can get another job and my salary will double, they may acknowledge that. It may be a factor, but right here and now, to make an assessment on your credit worthiness, they are only going to be concerned about the revenue that you actually make, the income that you actually make. And that is kind of what's happening with the Bahamas. So in that regard, we are weak. And this has never been like this before. Never before in the Bahamas has the country been under pressure, and we don't always see this pressure because 
up to now we have seen the maneuvering, right? In this particular budget, the PLP administration has been able to shift from really the highest historical point in terms of revenue, top line revenue, this country has ever seen and has been able to project an upward shift of about 300 to 400 million dollars additional. So there's room for maneuvering. There is, in my mind, and what I've said before, there is capacity, tax capacity available. But never before is the country under this type of a pressure to increase its revenue stream. And that is why you have these discussions which are taking place about getting revenue to GDP at 25%. So the pressures are real. But what does all of that mean? Why would, I guess the Prime Minister said this is going to be a landmark budget. Well, he said those for the reasons, that, for his own reason. But why did I say that this may be very well the most important budget in the history of the Bahamas? Because, simply put, if we get those things wrong, if we're unable to secure the revenue in a sustained way, at the end of the day, everything is going to kind of distill into a conversation about how exactly will we be able as a country to afford $11.6 billion. Everything is going to be distilled into the question as to the extent to which lenders are willing to roll over our debt. Those conversations are going to become more pointed, more clinical, and certainly more urgent. Never before has this been the case. So while I do understand and appreciate that some persons look at these budgets in terms of uh, an annual exercise, I've always placed a significant amount of stock on the fact that every single budget usually project at least two or three future fiscal, and that means something. Like, for example, the current fiscal year, the one that we are wrapping up um, right now, which will wrap up as at the end of June, will terminate in, with a deficit, I think, of about $700 million. Yeah? That's what a deficit is expected to be, a GFS deficit of 6%. Um, if we want to get into you know, some benchmarks, IMF usually recommend, well, you don't want to be above 7%. But interestingly, interestingly, that same document also projects 2024, no, no, 2023. So we're wrapping up 2022, which will terminate at about 700 million. It's projecting 2023 to be 500 plus million deficit still. And then in 2024 to be a deficit of 125 million dollars. The point I'm making is we're not out of the woods in terms of borrowing. If you take a, a look through the document and go through it very, very, very carefully, you will see that the overall debt servicing for the fiscal year 2022-2023 will sit at $1.8 billion. Of that $1.8, $589 million will be interest payment. Of that 589, 275 million will be paid to local residents and citizens and organizations, and the rest is going to be external. So an, a, a, a significant chunk of the 
our earnings is going out to pay interest. And a significant portion of that is actually going outside of the country. The local amount certainly turns over and is domiciled here, so that's fine. So the financing requirement, the financing requirement as stated by the document, is going to be $1.716 billion for this year. For next year, it's going to be $1.26 billion, and in 2025, $396 million. What is the point there? Even though these numbers are subject to change, they can go up, they can go down, uh, hopefully they're going down, they are indicative of the fact that we are not yet out of the borrowing woods. At $11.6 billion at the end of this year, with the expectation of borrowing more in the next year, we are still there. And so there, there, there are a number of um, issues which I think have come together to create a, a bit of a, 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 a vicious cycle, I would think, or a, 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 a vicious circumstance for the Bahamas. And that is why I kind of categorize the, this budget as being one of the most important. Because if those issues are not solved, if those issues which are impacting them are not solved, and we, are, we haven't yet seen, in my mind, we haven't yet seen the, the outflow or the more negative possibilities attached to those. But if we don't solve them in this budget, they're going to come down on us like a ton of bricks, potentially. And that's really, really one of the things that we want to be guarded against. I don't care what side of the, the fence you fall in terms of... Because sometimes I know that persons kind of see these things to John this eyes or from a philosophical perspective. But the one thing none of us um, should be out there wishing for is for this administration to fail in its management of the finances for certainly this fiscal and going forward. And certainly we want to be praying and open that there will be masterful management of the debt. So the debt management strategy is going to be so, so crucial for the entire future of the country going forward because without, without the space for borrowing, as, you, as I outlined earlier, without the space for borrowing, without the ability to create um, fiscal room, to create headroom, whatsoever one of those terms you want to use, we are going to get to a place where it's going to be a bit tighter. So hopefully, hopefully as projected, on the top side, we are going to see consistent growth in revenue and therefore less demand on demand for, 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 for debt. And as a result of that, we now start to kind of steady as projected that we will see a, defi uh, a surplus uh, a 1.9% surplus in 2025. That would be a good thing. But here are some of the things which the, the Prime Minister reminded in the budget yesterday. That the administration was elected on the 10-point plan to do these things, to recover, to rebuild, and ultimately revolutionize the economy. Details of which are contained in the document, our blueprint for change. And so I think it's always important that as we go through these budget discussions, as we talk about what the prime minister did or didn't do, what should have been there, and should, we, we always need to go back and remind ourselves uh, of those 10 point, under those 10 um, broad eras, exactly what the administration said that it would have done and really the basis on which the contract was formed between the PLP and the government uh, the PLP to become the government by the people of the Bahamas. So we are keen not merely to jumpstart the economy, says the Prime Minister, to stimulate economic activity and growth, but to do so in compassionate ways that brought hope and dignity back to the people. 
So here is here's a budget which has been presented which says, we recognize that the economy need to be jump-started. We recognize that there is a need to stimulate economic activity, and we also recognize that there is a need for growth. So as we discuss and as we deliberate on these things, it can be said that there isn't a very clear understanding of exactly what needs to be done. And these statements in and of themselves present a benchmark because as I am going through this, I'm, I'm asking myself, where is the jump start? Where is the stimulant? And where are the items which are going to create the growth? I'm not saying that they're not there, but those are the things I'm looking for because it says that's what's is going, that, that, that what's, what is supposed to be there. It's understood that these are the things which are needed to move the country forward. But very, very importantly, at least you know, from my perspective, it says it will do so in a compassionate way which will bring hope and dignity back to the people. So let's leave off the back to the people part, right? Because uh, I know persons will get into argument about that. But a compassionate way to create hope and to create dignity, I think those are fundamental. And one of the reasons that these three things, I believe, are very, very fundamental in any discussion around budget is that the, the, the pandemic, and even before the pandemic, the circumstances of the Bahamas was such that there are uh, a significant swath of individual out there, groupings, who are suffering. There's also a reality in the Bahamas where there is more of a divide being created between the haves and the have not. I'm not saying persons are moving away from each other. I'm just saying that there are more individuals who are experiencing challenges. So there's a small grouping who are actually having more, so their stock is growing, and there is a bigger grouping who find themselves in a struggling sense. Um, uh, a lot of persons express it like this, that the middle class is being destroyed. So the idea of creating hope and doing things with compassion and ensuring that there is dignity, in my mind, or at least to me, speak to um, some very, very important and fundamental things. When I think, for example, how some people live, where they live, um, the condition of their housing, the condition of the, the ability to access schooling, the ability to access um, education and healthcare, and some of the things which kind of cause you at the end of the day to you know, you know, you know, feel sometimes lesser than you are. When you think about these things and the fact that they are being contemplated in a budget presentation, I think that's a huge positive. Now, at the end of the day, having said it, then these things must be delivered. So the priorities in this particular budget were, are, the first priority is to help Bahamians cope with a cost of living crisis. Very first priority. A recognition that we are in a high inflationary environment, that there was a significant impact from the pandemic, there was a reduction in income, we are barely recovering, and we are under some pressure with, um, with, 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 with impact from, from, from supply chain issues, so on and so forth. So the first thing is to help them cope with cost of living crisis. The second one is the creation and expansion of jobs and ownership opportunities for Bahamians. And then the third one is to address various security issues to make our communities and homes safer and our borders more secure. So broadly speaking, that's what the Prime Minister set out to do in this particular budget. So this budget, the way forward, puts us firmly on course, he said, to continue to rescue the economy. It also charts a course to help us navigate some of the new challenges. So recognizing that, yes, we are where we are and that needs to be recovered, but we also have some new challenges. Inflation, high unemployment, 
flirting again with some uprising or upticking in COVID infections. So issues like those. And he's saying that this budget will deal with those new challenges. It will seek to maximize opportunities. So whatever opportunities are out there for country, are out there for individuals, it will seek to maximize those and it will deliver the necessary growth to support national development. From, from where I sit, from where I sit, theoretically, this statement or those statements which have been made up to this point tick all of the important boxes. Well, most of the important boxes. The recovery must continue. There are new challenges to be dealt with and they have to be dealt with, they have to be confronted. There are opportunities that we have that exist which need to be maximized, which need to be exploited, have to be done. And very, very importantly, there is the recognition that this economy needs to grow. And so it says, and deliver growth necessary to support national development, and deliver growth necessary to support national development. A recognition that if there is going to be national development, substantial, sustainable national development, then there must be growth. Now, how does this tie up with the actual numbers? Because as it relates to growth, one of the areas which troubles me in my analysis is that while the Bahamas is bouncing back reasonably well, won't get back to 2019 levels uh, immediately, we have not yet gotten back there. When you look at the projections into the future, you get the impression that we are quickly reverting to our historical levels of growth. So on, one, on the one hand, on the one hand, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Finance, clearly recognize the need for there to be growth. But on the other hand, being constrained, I think, with making reasonable projections, the projections suggest that the growth levels are not going to be as robust as we would want them to be. And they're certainly not going to be at levels which are much different from our historical experience. And that, therefore, presents a, a bit of a bother. It means that the low growth that we have experienced over the long while will continue to happen in the context of still having need for borrowing and in the context of having created a budgetary allocation of about $3.3 billion, a number of which really is pointed to social support, which is stated here as a clear example dealing with cost of living, but also creating opportunities for behemoths and ownership and so on and so forth. But those have to be funded. And the fact that they're there in an increasing um, direction will create some tension on the performance. So if, if, if there's a challenge, for example, in getting to that $2.8 billion in revenue, then there could be a potential expansion. Well, there will be. If you don't get there and you expend all you plan on expending, certainly the deficit will increase. And we must remember, we must remember that we are looking at a deficit which I think just from, from, from memory, I think the one year it was 800 million, then we got to 1.3 or 1.2, and then it's now 700. But when you look at it, if you kind of throw out um, the, 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 the $1.3 billion, over the last, uh, I would say, three years, yeah, over the last three years, we've kind of been in the same ballpark, you know. And... That is something I think we ought not to miss in our, in our assessment 
of not just this budget, but the overall budgetary allocations for the country. The way I tend to look at it is, on average, the, the country presents a budget on an expenditure side of about $3 billion on average. And on average, revenue is usually at about $2.5 billion, which means that on average, we always have a deficit of half a billion dollars. I read something the other day, and I, I, it, was, it just came across a very interesting, very simple idea, just didn't think about it in terms like that, that restyle debt says, after all, that debt isn't anything other than accumulated deficits. And so if we are getting into that realm where we are kind of hitting the upper limits of the normal $500 million, then there is a little bit of a, a, a reason or a cause to, you know, to start being concerned. And that's why it's so important. I think it's fundamentally important that we start to move the trajectory in the direction of getting to that 25%. I had the opportunity to moderate a session the other night, and when I did ask the Minister of Economic Affairs whether or not this budget is going to move us on the, in, on the trajectory or create the momentum towards that 25%, he said yes. He said yes. And if you look at the numbers, that's certainly what is happening. Now, the, one of the things that you could have taken away on that night before this budget was presented was the possibility that there would have been some new forms of taxation. But of course, the government had, uh, the administration had quickly taken that off the table. There was going to be no new taxes, which didn't mean that there wasn't going to be increased taxes. But interestingly, we have achieved that movement, that trajectory has been changed. The momentum has been created without any new exotic type of taxes. And that holds, I think, positive possibilities or positive implications for the future from the perspective of reaching the 25%, um, not necessarily from the perspective of persons who may ultimately be taxed. So let's see how that goes. There is, a, a, is an aspect of the budget which I've read, I've reflected on, and uh, I think it's, it, it's worthy of mention. Put it this way. There's a statement in there which says, I wish to highlight the fact that even though this budget represents an important part of the government's overall strategy to grow the economy, it does not represent the entire effort. Aside from the allocation of resources from the consolidated fund, the government intends to leverage other mechanisms to bolster economic activity and stimulate job creation. So, there are a number of potential takeaways from that. The current administration have a couple of trump cards up its sleeve. Things that it is working on which it does not want to mention at this point in time, which have the potential to actually bolster economic activity. In this regard, I think it's vague from uh, a budget perspective. I would prefer, uh, at least I want to think about the budget as being contained enough to present the truest possible picture of what will happen going forward. So to that extent, these things are vague. But if we take them at face value, then obviously there are some things which are in the consciousness of the administration which we don't yet fully understand, which could be positive for the country, and so we'll have to look at that. The corollary to that is that if there are opportunities to bolster from a revenue point of view, there also may be obligations from a cost perspective. And hopefully, at the end of the day, it would be net revenue. But if it is not, at least in the first instance, 
let's say there is a potential to bolster and to bring in additional revenue, but those revenue would have to be projected out 24 to 36 months, and we start working on them now, in the first instance, there may be costs. And those costs, at the end of the day, if they are captured under the 2023 um, fiscal, would definitely cause the deficit to shift. From that perspective, not something to beat the drums about too, too much. But I think it's a point of caution, something to, to watch. Because the extent to which there may be those costs which have not been captured in the budget at this point in time puts the deficit at risk of potential expansion. Yep. I think we should take a break here. So let's take a break, and when we come back, we want to talk a little bit more about the deficit. We want to talk a little bit more about some of the aspects which the, 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 the Prime Minister highlighted, like um, the small business development and maritime. And then we'll also take a nice look at cruise about some of the highlights, some of the things which I thought were... Um, noteworthy, things which we need to at least mention and remind ourselves that as we analyze and, 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 and provide commentary on this um, particular budget and the way forward, that we may want to remind ourselves and, and be mindful, be mindful that these are some of the underlying, underlying basis and assumptions, if you will, which flowed into the thinking, which terminated into the numbers that we were presented with. You listen to the essentials, the reset. Don't move. Come right back. And on the other side, you can join us. 323-6232, 325-4315, no, 325-4316, and 325-4259. A text line, 422-4796. Come right back. Don't move. for a hurricane can make all the difference in safeguarding lives by knowing what actions you should take to reduce the effects of hurricane disaster. Get all the facts of the potential of having insurance, impact resistant windows, home emergency power, surge protectors, essential supplies, plus so much more before the storm, after the storm, where to purchase building or cleaning supplies, waste disposal, medical care, which auto shop to go to after driving through flooded streets and more. The Nassar Guardian's Hurricane Guide will help to make sure everyone knows what to do in the event a hurricane approaches. Take advantage of this double insertion opportunity plus 15 radio commercials. Contact us today, 302-2300, or your account executives. Will you be prepared? For the best jerk in the Bahamas, you must have Baloo's. Pork, fish, and chicken served with our delicious country-style sauce and authentic festivals. Baloo's, Nassau East South, call or what's up 376-8951. Baloo's, the jerk with the soul of reggae and the spirit of Junkanoo. Baloo's jerk, traditional, slow-cooked to perfection. 376-8951, get yours today. The new Guardian Radio app is here. Listen live to all our Guardian Radio shows and live video stream select programs in our studio. Get information about Guardian Radio shows and our hosts. Send messages including text, email, and even call. All from our amazing new Guardian Radio app. Download it free today in your app store for your Apple device or Play Store for your Android device. The all new and improved Guardian Radio app. This is Guardian Radio, 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day.
and uh, <laughs> welcome back to the essentials the reset we have in ourselves a little bit of a walk through the budget presentation that was given by the honorable prime minister brave davis yesterday and we are you know kind of looking at you know some of the numbers and talking about um some of the issues which would kind of develop out of that we have a text here a couple of texts uh, at the risk of being considered unpopular with the citizenry how serious is this administration about enforcement of taxes of tax compliance and collection well I would say that uh, as a, even in opposition, or before they became the government, one of the things that they talked about a lot uh, was the reinstatement of the enforcement unit. And you would have heard in recent times that some of the reforms or some of the things which have been done as it relates to real property tax and so on, uh, is it, a move in this direction. So... I don't think we can, we, it, it would be fair to say that they're not serious. Based on the action, they're definitely moving in this direction. There's, however, I would think a point of, of reflection, if you will, um, the recent disclosure by the financial secretary that there was a significant amount of debt outstanding, uh, tax outstanding, which without um, levying this or putting this at the feet of the current administration, they just got there. But I would say overall that government need to become more serious about punishing individuals. And I use punishing in very, very clear terms. And the reason I do that and I do it without a blink of my eye is that I pay my taxes. I do pay my taxes. Um, any tax that I have outstanding at this moment is not past due. And because I have to sacrifice to do that, it's not easy to pay. Um, you know, I could pretty much use that money to do anything else. There are a lot of things which I could do with that money. But I do pay my taxes, and I believe that everyone should. Persons should not be um, skating by, living off the the backs of other persons who sacrificed to do this. And I, so I think um, from that perspective, Texas, I think they need to get a little bit more serious. Not speaking to this particular administration, I'm talking about the civil service and the administration of taxes in general. It has to become serious. And I think this plays into your other text where you said, I understand the reason for tax relaxation and incentives and increase increments in wages. However, we must, as a country, attempt to change the mindset of our citizenry because a lot of our people are not tax compliant. Not because they cannot pay, but it's not a priority. And for these people, we must try to change the mindset to educate and encourage tax compliance so that the bigger issue of national debt can seriously can be seriously addressed and lowered. When this happens, there would be no need for talking about higher VAT percentage and even more taxes. But the mindset of the masses must be encouraged to change and any reward must be based on being tax compliant Etc. I agree, a hundred percent, one hundred thousand percent. We have to get to the point, I believe. And you know, nobody wants to voluntarily pay taxes. If I could get through life without paying a single tax, a single fee, that would be my ideal circumstance. But that's not how life works. The country has to be managed, the country has to be run, and the things which need to be done must be financed. But I think, Texter, you hit the ball out of the park, you hit the nail on the head. The issue, this issue of, as you, as you put it, I want to use your exact word, 
so that the bigger issue of national debt, the bigger issue of national debt can be dealt with. And I believe that in every single discussion around the economy, around the performance thereof, in every single analysis of this budget, the previous budget or the one to come, in every assessment of government policy at whatsoever level, government pronouncement, whatsoever it is that the administration does or don't do, the bigger issue is the debt. Every single action that this government takes, every action, every policy shift, every spending cut, every spending increase, every increase in taxes, every, every single shift, the backdrop for that is, as you put it, the bigger national debt. Because at the end of the day, that is the biggest boogeyman, if you will, which lurks around the corner, waiting to be dealt with or not dealt with so you can grow bigger. It's very, very important, as you said, for there to be an understanding that the way to grappling with this bigger debt issue is either the country is going to grow and produce surpluses or persons are going to be taxed more. And when they are taxed, they have to be compliant. I also agree with your underlying point that we have to get to the place where if individuals are reaping rewards, if they have the potential, like some of the rewards which have been announced in this particular budget, they are not to benefit, they should not benefit if they're not tax compliant in every single regard. If they haven't paid their value-added tax, if they haven't paid their um, NIB for their staff, if they haven't paid their property tax, then they shouldn't benefit from any type of concession and, in and incentives that the government has to offer. It just absolutely shouldn't happen because technically what's happening there is that you're taking taxes paid by some other people and giving it to an individual who has already decided to subsidize him or herself by not paying the taxes already owed. And in that regard, those individuals should be punished. One, they should not have the ability to get these incentives, and they should be coerced into paying what they already owe. I, 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 I want to say this to, to the country. I want to say this to us. Where the country is economically today, believe me, it needs every single penny of tax that it can muster. If some fundamental shifts are not to happen in the near future, you have to go pay the tax you owe. We have to settle that $1 billion. We have to ensure that persons who are paying property tax does so on a consistent basis. We have to ensure that you are not gaming the business license so that you can avoid paying taxes. It's important. It's important. Now, you know, if you do that and get rich, you know, you'll be fine. But bear in mind that you're going to be hurting somebody. And at least somebody in your family may not be your direct family. It may be a cousin, second cousin, somebody down the line. They're going to be hurt also. So be mindful that each of us have a obligation in this whole thing. And I, I believe yesterday in the budget presentation, there was a line where the prime minister actually called on or stated that it is ready to work, the government, the administration, is ready to work with everyone to make this country work. And I think that's an important call. I, I, I wrote a statement the day before the budget. And one of the things that I said in that statement was that 
this particular budget should be a national call to the private sector, national call to all sectors of the economy, or the country, rather, that we need to get into the business of growth and innovating, especially in the private sector. We need to get to the place where all citizens and residents understand that they have a role to play exactly what um, the text uh, outlined just now. We have to get to the place where we start to understand that this is not the government problem to fix. We must get to that spot. We must get to that place where we understand and accept that the bigger issue of the debt is always going to be lurking and the underlying issue is that the debt is connected to taxes and taxation because that's the only place the government gets its revenue from and ultimately somebody will have to pay i think it's easier i think it will be more beneficial for the country as a country for us to arrest this problem of the debt. And by arrest, I don't mean that we are going to pay it off. There's certainly no way to pay off uh, $11, $10 billion in a very short time. That won't happen. What we need to do is to get to a place where the debt is seen in favorable light, where the country starts to improve its credit rating, where we get upgraded a couple of times, and as a result of that, it removes the premium from uh, the, the, the premium that persons are asking. We have to get to a place where it's a little bit more virtuous than it is at this point in time. And how do we get there? It's all about debt management and it's all about taxation. No matter how you want to slice it, no matter how much you don't like taxes, it's about that. And if you're one of those persons who really, really don't like taxes like most humans do, you have to think about it this way. A stitch in time saves nine. If we do the things that we need to do today, we have the potential of restricting or reducing the costs that we will pay tomorrow. In that same statement, I think I mentioned that this particular budget, this was my expectation. This particular budget should focus clinically on the decisions that we need to make today for a better tomorrow. And that's basically what it is. I think that is absolutely so, so important. And it's one of the reasons why I did coin and still believe that we are at a place where we are dealing with one of the most significant budget in the history of this country. Because if we get it wrong at this juncture, it's going to be way more costly later on. Very, very significantly more costly. There are a number of um, matters which was discussed. Um, there's incentives. There were reduction in taxes, some as it relates to food, and so on and so forth. Um, let me take this. I have somebody here who is engaging. Thank you for reading. It's a serious issue. I totally agree with you. I would read your text, and I believe that you, you have um, very eloquently texted her. Latch on on what is the fundamental issue. Everything else is, you know, kind of bush. You know, when we chop that out, we are going to get right down to the meat of the matter. Um, it is easy to do. We must, like the USA, tie taxes to things like renewal of driver's license, for example, almost like forcing compliance has to happen. Yeah, you have to figure out a way, punish you. So you can, you don't pay your taxes, you don't get your license. You don't do this, you don't do that. These are the things which need to be done. I totally agree with you. But like you said, like you said, it all comes down to this bigger issue of the debt. And so as I listened, well, I didn't get much chance to listen because I was in meetings for the most part of yesterday, all well and certainly long after the presentation was ended. So as I read through the budget, I saw matters being mentioned such as, you know, we have begun the process of 
Improvement for the Revenue Enhancement Unit, TEXA. That's what has been done. Um, legislation has been brought for Public Procurement and Fiscal Responsibility Act and Public Financial Management. Those are important issues. Um, we have reduced the VAT to 10%. We know that that is what it is. I think some of the measures in this budget was kind of counterbalancing the removal of zero-rated and the exempt items. Overall, the changes in VAT has been good for the Bahamas because it has turned out to be, to be uh, uh, revenue positive. Well, I didn't say that. I know it may come across like I just said that myself. No, I'm just simply reading from a statement which was made in the budget. It says, overall, the changes to VAT have been good for the Bahamas. That's what the Prime Minister said. And the basis of saying that is that because of the changes which were made, actually at 10%, more VAT has been collected than it was at the 12% level. Uh, there has been... Um, the, the country now has a trade policy, or they're working on a trade policy. There have been some changes to um, having new cultural and trade ambassador. You know, the, there's discussion around uh, energy reform. The Minister of Works is expected to elaborate on plans as, as it relates to BPL when we hear his sectoral debate. Um, expenditure performance, we would have talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, where the, the, the deficit is terminating at um, 756 or 6% of GDP. Uh, we have seen discussion around minimum wage increase for public sector worker, discussion around contributory pension plans, uh, social assistance to persons who have been hit by the pandemic. Uh, you know, so th th there are a lot of things in there. Funding for NGOs, reduction of taxation on certain entities which provide social support, the revamping or reintroduction of the RISE program. There, there, there are a lot of stuff inside this. Honestly, there is a lot to chew on. But you have to take them in context that these things, they're not free. They come at a cost and they are as a result of trade-offs between expenditure today and an expected outcome for tomorrow. But I want to take you back to one important thing tying in with the theme of my text here, very important, is that the only thing that was mentioned in this presentation about debt management or the debt is when the Prime Minister indicated that we have appointed a private sector debt management committee assisted by an independent financial advisor who will devise clear objectives and a strategy to, man to manage the high levels of debt accumulated in the past three years. Now let's take the first part first. We have appointed a private sector debt management committee positive, good thing, right direction. This committee is assisted by a independent, an independent financial advisor. That is positive. That sends a great message. You bring in a great level of professionalism to the whole process. Who will devise clear objectives and a strategy to manage the high level of debt in the past three years? So that's all fine in context. What I believe was a missed opportunity is that there should have been greater discussion about the debt. There should have been greater discussion about where we are going in terms of the debt management strategy. Here's why I think that is so. If you look and analyze the numbers... If you take a very, very careful look at the numbers, starting with the fact that we terminate with a deficit, starting, and no, not starting, but considering that there are a number of already highlighted and accepted areas of reforms, like state-owned entities, which we have already agreed maybe two, three years ago, or even four years ago, that these are areas which need to be changed. Understanding that there was a directional move of having 
a $100 million reduction on state-owned entity subsidy over the next four years or over, the next, over four years at the time. When you take these into consideration and when you look at where the expenditure terminated and the fact that we have a deficit, you have to ask yourself, looking through the lens of a lender, what question will that person ask? What question will the credit market ask of you? Are you, as a result of this budget, improving the credit worthiness of the country? That will be the, that's a natural question to be asked. And I'm not saying that by having a deficit, deficit you automatically made the country worse. That's not the point I'm making. I'm saying in the totality of this budget, has it shifted, has it moved the needle positively in terms of the country's credit worthiness? What would be your conclusion? So without drawing a conclusion on that, I'm just going to hang you out a little bit in a bit of suspense. Without drawing a conclusion on that, the question there to be asked is where is the counterbalance of any potential adverse conclusion which may be drawn from that particular circumstance? And I believe that the counterbalance would have been a fuller discussion around the debt strategy. What has been contemplated? Where are we going? What are some of the areas of uh, improvement? How are we tapping into the, the, the domestic market? When we had the roundtable discussion with uh, Minister Halkitis, he made mention of some of these initiatives which uh, uh, have already started to tap into the domestic market, which I believe is an important way forward because if we have the ability to reset and to roll over some of this international debt based on replace them with local money, it's going to take a lot of pressure. It's going to pull some levers on the debt stock. So I think those are important. So there need to, or should have been, or at least I believe at the prime minister's level, at the, well, not prime minister, but the minister of finance level, this first presentation could have had a fuller discussion as a counterbalance, as a counterbalance to the fact that there have been some decisions taken in this particular budget, maybe for justifiable reasons. Like for one of the reasons, one of the reasons there's not a reduction in state-owned entities is I would think while we don't want it to be so, but an objective assessment suggests that some of these entities still need significant support. And in many ways, it would be foolhardy because some are so critically important to the normal everyday life of the country like you know, Bahamas Air and BPL and other entities. It could be tantamount balanced and objectively considered. It could be tantamount to cutting off your nose to suit your face had there been the reduction. So I am not harping on the fact that there wasn't a reduction. There may have been some opportunity to do that a little bit more, but the unbalanced, they decide that's not the way to go at this point in time with a weakened economy. So I can live with that decision. All I'm saying is that having made the decision, the ultimate outturn of the budget suggests that while the trajectory has, uh, has changed because we will be moving, all things being equal, we'll be moving from the 700 plus million for this year and we would drop down to 500 plus, so a change of about 200 million or so. So it's a good direction. And the following year, it has been reduced, and then the next year, it's going into a it's going into a surplus. So those are important, and this is one of the reasons why I said that this may be a very very important budget if we take into consideration not in isolation just 2022 23. If we look at it that way, then it's just another budget. But if we consider that the projection for the next three fiscal 
are really serious projections emanating out of the decision which has been taken here and now and the policy positions which are going to be committed to seriously for the future, then we start to understand. So using those numbers in there, for example, if we move in that direction, then there's certainly a story, a narrative to be told to the credit markets, which I think was missed. There's also, well, yeah, so the sto there was a story in terms of the reduction, which was, which was missed. And there is a story which cannot be gleaned from whatsoever was presented there, and that is in relation to the work of the Debt Management Committee. I would just would have loved to see some something on that because I um, it's my view that the lenders, the credit markets are out there watching and looking for something positive in that direction. When you consider that there is a what the, the number is one point nine, I think the the the, the, the fund no one point seven. When you consider that there is a $1.7 billion financing need and there is debt redemption of about $1.3 billion. I think some of that may be local. So the extent which it is domestic, rollover risk is a kind of zero to none. It's going to be rollover. But to the extent that some of these debts are, are external, it provides a, a little bit more of a challenge for the country. And sooner or later, we're going to get to the place where that becomes more and more significant. I understand there's a text. I understand, the, I understand about the task force relative to debt management, also the additional funding for monitoring CPI. However, it all still boils down to enforcement and compliance. We must get serious. We heard about the Credit Bureau. What is happening with that? I think the Credit Bureau is up and running. Um, there is work being done, I guess, to collate and populate information uh, for various lenders. And so in, uh, in the not too distant future, I believe in the not too distant future, we will start to see and feel the effect of that. All I can say to persons that if you are not in good stead in terms of your borrowing uh, behavior um, in terms of your repayment uh, experience, in terms of you having defaulted on loans, having multiple loans in banks and, and at furniture stores and all over the place. Uh, you know, you need to spend some time starting to think about those because you definitely, definitely could be at the adverse side of whatsoever is coming down the pipe. So we want to, we want to get to the place where we start to um, not only fix the economy and the finances of the country, but we also have to do so at, uh, at the individual level. It's absolutely important. We all have a role to play. Because when you're good, when you're good as an individual, when you manage your finances, and you can function independently, then the government has less of an obligation to find social spending. So, you know, these things are not unconnected. If every single worker, if every single individual was to go out and just do nonsense with whatsoever resources they have, obviously, at some point, it would end up in the, in the hands of one or two persons. But if a large, large number of persons was to live like that, the government would be swamped because one of the, one of the purposes of government is to ensure the well-being of people. And if you have tons and tons of persons who cannot function on their own, function independently, independently, um, financially independent, then the government will have to step in. The country will be robbed of... Uh, some of its potential because, you know, when persons don't have money, when persons can't find resources, then students don't go to school, they don't make it to university. The, the, quality, of the, the quality of education in the country may fall off, stuff like that, yeah? 
and the government will be under pressure to still provide education and still provide more social services. So everything that we're talking about, your own discipline from a borrowing perspective, the way you live, the way you manage your resources, it's all connected. So we have our part to play. So we have to take care of our microeconomy, our own individual economy, as we depend on and trust that the government is going to make the right decision on the macro stuff. From a micro perspective, organization, private sector companies, they'll have to do the same. They'll have to take care of their own microeconomies and trusting that the government is going to do the right thing and facilitate and put things in place which is going to help them to thrive. Yeah? So that's kind of where we are. We have another text. Yes, it's all interrelated. This person is a grain. Yeah, the whole thing is connected. Every single thing is connected. The moment, the moment we start to see an adverse shift at the national level on any aspect of fiscal um, numbers, any aspect of the economy, somebody is getting squeezed. Somebody down the line is getting poorer. Somebody is being asked or will be asked in the future to pay more in taxes. When things start to go south, these are the things which happen. Now, it don't always have to be taxes. I know we, you know, and, and I do this maybe too often, but we always harp on that because possibly it's kind of the easy way to go because, you know, if you have a country which has gotten used to a certain level of service, I believe um, governments generally uh, don't like to, 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 to cut those. You know, so you have schools and you have hospital and you have all of these things available. The government, uh, I think, may be more predisposed, if it has to, to find more revenue to afford some other things than to reduce the cost and take away stuff. But that's an option. It's called austere measure, austerity. So we have to bear in mind that if the government can't afford to do certain things, it will have to either cut costs or increase taxes, none of which any of us like or want. But on the same hand, on the same hand, the government must always be mindful that when it spends, the spending is effective and there is productive results emanating from those spend, those investments. And to the extent that that is not so, cuts are warranted. So when we look at the amount of money being allocated for SOE, I think north of 400, just north of 400 million, we can make an argument. Are these SOEs being managed effectively? Are the boards in these SOE fully cognizant of what it means to run an organization? Are the roles and responsibilities of executive management clearly defined? Are persons going in there from the board and crossing the lines and going into the realm of management? Are there individuals in management who feel that they can cross over and kind of hold the board hostage? Do the members of the board, do individual directors understand their responsibility, have the necessary knowledge and the wherewithal to effectively provide oversight? You see, from my perspective, it's not always about cutting money or putting more money there. Sometimes it's about getting back to the fundamentals. As we say here on the show, let's get down to the essentials. At the end of the day, oversight, effective management, strategic management, effective risk management, effective governance is kind of some of the foundational stuff which need to be done, which need to be in place, which need to be effective in order for you to determine how well, how effective you can be in curtailing spending in these areas. Because guess what? The moment an institution becomes effective in and of itself, the need for funding reduces and the whole thing starts to fall away. So rather than 
only look at it within the context of we need to cut some money from these agencies. We have to ask the question, what useful purpose they serve? And they, in many instances, they serve very useful purpose. At least that was the intention. The question is, how effectively then are they discharging their mandates? Because they have national mandates, whether to facilitate agricultural development, whether to um, facilitate lending as a development bank, whether it is to provide effective air transportation, whatsoever it is. How effectively are they doing that? And if the answer is it's not effective, then we have to ask the question, why isn't this so? Are they in a market which is just totally um, not capable of supporting them? Like, um, I believe an argument can be made for Bahamas here to that extent, that it provides a service and is in a market where it's never, in my mind, going to be hugely profitable. But even in that instance, using Bahamas here as an example, you ask the question, uh, okay, um, so we may be in a state where we are always making losses, or but how can we minimize those losses? How can we squeeze the greatest value out of these organizations? Because the more value you squeeze, the more effective they become, the more they save, then obviously you are managing this bigger picture or bigger issue, as the text has said, of the debt, you imagine it, margin, margin, oh man, I can't say that word, managing at both ends, recognizing that one end of the pipe there is wastage, and the other end of the pipe where the revenue, that's where the water flows in, there is not, not enough going there. So as the country works on this issue of you know, grappling with growth and increasing revenue, it is also, on the other hand, ensuring that there is no leakage, there is no wastage. So whatsoever resources that we can afford to bring together and pull together, it's available for the betterment of the country. It's been used effectively, and it has been used in vehicles, i.e. the agencies and the various corporations. It has been used in vehicles which are running effectively, which are running optimally, which are running at the best possible level. Therefore, if it does not have the ability to be profitable, it is operating at a level where it's containing the loss as best as it can. And as a result of that, the government will need to pump less in that as a support. There will be some which have the ability to turn totally into revenue positive generator. That's a possibility. And as a result of that, they need less support. Now, we have to bear in mind that in some instance, in this old reform process, if we go down that road, then some of the services or maybe all of the services that they provide will need to attract some sort of a fee. So on one hand, you may pay a little bit more or more. But on the other hand, it would take pressure of the national budget, the national uh, wallet, and the quality of service will be better, and therefore, they are delivering greater value and ultimately creating the environment which they were created to provide in the first instance. And as a result of that, they no longer necessarily, to the extent that they are now, cost, but they get into the place where they are more beneficial for a country. So again, we have to look at this in all the terms. Uh, Acronyms, please explain because some people don't know. Oh, SOEs, my bad, state owned enterprises. State owned enterprises, SOE. Yes, effective management and accountability needs to definitely be improved across the board, but because we put politics in everything, they are allowed to ride, even though it is negative profit or running at a continuous deficit. Yeah. So, yeah, this idea of uh, about putting politics, politics is going to be in everything as long as human beings walk this road, walk this hurt, right? So it's not 
really about removing politics from the whole thing. It's about how do we run the things that we run and we do them effectively. So if the decision is, you know, you're not the right person to be there, or you are the person that we want to be there, but you have to go to some training and orientation, and you have to meet the level of requirement, however you achieve that, in order for you to remain, then that's what needs to be done. So in many ways, we have the power, I believe. Regardless of how it is at this point in time, we have the power to change around whatsoever it is that we are experiencing. The important issue is that we have to have the will and the commitment and the wear it all to start to move in that direction. And so we are clean out of time, and so we have to leave it there. I hope that this discussion would provide you with some insight and some thinking and maybe uh, one or two different perspectives than you would have held up to now as to how to contemplate this. There are no unconnected issues here. Everything is connected. Everything is interrelated. And as we discuss this budget and as we comment on it, whether you want to believe that this is the most important one or whether you want to believe the Prime Minister that this is a landmark budget or not, remember this. The bigger issue, the big, big issue, the most fundamental issue that we face as a country today, will face tomorrow, and will face for the next couple of years is the level of the debt. It is certainly our most important and potentially serious Achilles heel and present the greatest risk, the greatest risk to the plans which are outlined in this. And consequently, and consequently, it must be dealt with masterfully. It has to be managed creatively and it has to be done effectively to send a message to the rest of the world that we are in the business of improving country and we understand what needs to be done. So we're going to leave it there and all we're left to say is to be a good walk, good take care. COVID is not finished. So don't be, you know, bouncing up on anyone, you know, stay your distance. But as usual, we always say, do not allow your greatness to become a victim of your unwillingness to change. You've been listening to The Essentials, The Reset. Good night, one love, Ubuntu.